I think the topic of the morning session is asymmetric activists or activism. And I think the case of Tibet clearly presents that challenge. As Chen Gongsheng said, the Chinese government spends more for internal security than for external defense. 111 billion dollars for internal security of its own population than 107 billion dollars for the external defense. So you can see the asymmetric dynamic. The power dynamic is such lopsided that even Chen Gongcheng Bin, being a Han Chinese majority, faces a daunting challenge. Now take the case of Tibet. We are just six million population and there are 1.2 billion Han Chinese. We are just half percent of population of Han Chinese. Meaning for every Tibetan, there are 99 and half Chinese if you have to deal with them. Given such challenges, being in exile, there are a lot of day-to-day -day experience that you are under tremendous pressure. Let me give you an example. I received an email from Time magazine that the journalist wanted to come to Dharamsala to interview me. And obviously, we were delighted, welcomed her. A few days later, I received another email from her saying, these are the questions I want to ask you. And I said, the journalist being so generous that she is sending me all her questions before coming to Dharamsala. But then I thought, a symmetric power dynamic, $111 billion for internal security. And I wrote back without opening the attachment. And I said, did you send this email, Hannah? She wrote back, said she never did. And she tracked it to some other sources. So had I opened the attachment, my computer would go gone kaput. And I'm sure some of the tech experts would not be able to help me as well. Hence, Tibetans, we follow a Buddha's a teaching. In Buddhism, we say, you know, attachment is one of the cardinal sins. <laughs> Hence, the joke goes, when you send an email to Buddha, how will he reply? No attachment, please. <laughs> so all the dissidents here, don't open your attachment and listen to Buddha. <laughs> that applies both to the email as well as to the power and authority that it comes along. So as far as I'm concerned, compared to many of the dissidents here or in exile uh, here, uh, being, I'm different in the sense Chen was born and brought up in China. He came to exile. As far as I'm concerned, I have never been to Tibet. I have never seen Tibet. I was in Beijing in 2005. The Chinese government did not allow me to go to Lhasa, the capital city of Tibet, even though it was just three hours flight. And I asked why. They said, we don't have enough people to receive you in Lhasa. And I said, you have 1.3 billion people. <laughs> of all the problems, that should not be the major issue. They said, nope, we don't have enough people to receive you in Lhasa. That's why I can't go. But I've never seen Tibet. But I'm proud to be born a Tibetan. And I'm proud to serve as a Tibetan. So when I look back in life, I want to die without regrets. Hence, I committed myself to the Tibetan cause. And that is why in 2011, when Tibetans around the world in 40 some countries, from Oslo to Orawa, Alaska to Australia, voted and elected me, even though I had spent 16 years in America, uh, to be precise, at Harvard Law School, never worked in Tibetan administration in Dharamsala, but they elected me. And I decided to leave America, leave Harvard, and go to Dharamsala to work for the Tibetan cause, to serve the Tibetan people, because as per the vision of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, when he fled Tibet in 1959, along with 80,000 Tibetans, he faced a similar challenge many of the activists in this room face. They are in exile, what to do? But he had this vision of investing in nonviolence and democracy, to setting up a democratic system in exile. 
so that once you're back, if you can have a democratic system, you can bring Tibetans all over the world under one umbrella. Through democratic processes, you can unify Tibetans. Hence, we have built Tibetan administration in exile, in Dharamsala. It functions like any other government. We have foreign or international relations, home department, education department, religion and culture, finance, security, health. We run about 70 some schools, uh, several dozen hospitals and clinics, 250 or so monasteries and nunneries. Compared to many of the exile groups or refugee groups, perhaps being un-Buddhist here, perhaps the Tibetan administration is one of the most effective administration that you will see. Why I present this case to you is because many of you are new to exile and you have to sustain and you have to grow stronger so that when the opportunity comes, you are there to take advantage of it. That opportunity might take a long time. That's why I often say, for any movement, the beginning is brutal because you lose your freedom, you lose your country, but short. Ending is also is sweet and pleasant, but also short. Because next day reality sets in, you have to begin to govern or you have to begin to deliver. The middle is the most difficult part. And that's when many of the unsung, unsung, unsung heroes are born. That's when, when it looks so hopeless or helpless, when it looks so daunting, so overwhelming, that's when you are needed the most. That's when you need an administration, you need an infrastructure. Person alone cannot do much. As much as you are committed, as much as you have the courage, but you need an infrastructure. That is why Tibetan administration based in Dharamsala could be a model for many, many of you because the foreign aid we get is limited because of the Chinese government pressure. But we run it frugally and effectively. Our annual budget is 20 some million dollars. But we run, as I said, about 70 some schools, dozen or so hospitals, 12 foreign offices, and 60 or so Tibetan uh, refugee camps in India, Nepal, and Bhutan. We do it because we take a pay cut. For example, I had a decent job at Harvard Law School. When Tibetans elected me, I took the job for a pay of $367 a month. At least I have the title. Many of my friends from San Francisco, from Orawa, uh, from Los Angeles, from Europe joined me for less salary than me. This is a labor of love as far as we are concerned, but we do it democratically. For example, Tibetans are scattered in 40 some countries and all of us participate in election. Tibetans, let's say in Changdang, Ladakh, is 5,000 to 6,000 meters high. But the local Tibetan election officials, on March 20th was the final day of the election. At that time, it was minus 40 degrees. But still, the local Tibetan officials carried the ballot boxes on the backs of yaks and donkeys, climbed mountains for days so that these few nomads in the tents could vote. That's how we participate from all over the world. That's why Tibetans, in one sense, are unified. That was the vision of His Holiness Dalai Lama. We are fulfilling it. At the same time, there was also a Buddhist element to Tibetan democracy. The final candidates were three of us. And two of us had debate in Dharamsala. That's where we are based. So after the debate, the problem was, next day we had had another debate in Delhi. That's 12 hours drive from Dharamsala. So we looked at each other, two of the uh, candidates, and said, let's share a taxi together. So we took the taxi together throughout the night. Early in the morning, we reached a Tibetan camp there. We could not find hotel rooms because most of them were packed. So finally, we found two hotel, two rooms. One was used by the organizers, and other was two of the candidates. So can you imagine two candidates sharing taxi and sharing a uh, room together? So next day we had good breakfast, good round of debate, good lunch, gave each other campaign tips, and went our ways. 
So that is, that is our prescription to the September election of Norway and to all the candidates around the world. <laughs> but once you invested in democracy and violence, it has both the strength and the sustainability of the cause. Hence, we are very confident that our day will come. One, because we are competing with communist ideology. And as far as Tibetans are concerned, our philosophy is based on Buddhism, which is 2,500 years old. Communism is just hundreds some years old. So there is no competition at all. And as far as Tibetan history is concerned, it's as old and as rich as Chinese history. As far as Tibetan civilization is concerned, we are as rich as, rich as Chinese. As far as Tibetan identity, Tibetan dignity, sense of Tibetan spirit is concerned, even though there is tragedy unfolding in Tibet, 117 Tibetans have burned themselves. It's one of the highest death toll in recent history. Still they are burning. It's sad, it's tragic. Yet at the same time, Tibetan spirit and unity of Tibetans inside and outside has never been stronger. That's why we believe our day will come. Why there are self immolations Continuing occupation and repression of Tibetans. If you say two words in the streets of Lhasa, the capital city of Tibet, human rights, you get arrested, you get tortured, and you at United Nations human rights organizations say, you disappear and you die. When there is no room for any form of protest, no space for any form of protest, and the fear of getting arrested and long imprisonment and torture is so terrifying, Tibetans are choosing to die immediately than fall in the hands of Chinese authorities. That is why Many of the self immolators are drinking poison before they self immolate. They are drinking petrol before they self immolate. They are leaving last words to the friends, telling them, don't make me fall in the hands of Chinese authorities. So the blame for self immolation lies with Beijing. The solution also lies with Beijing. But Tibetans, we are determined to fight what is ours, our basic freedom. That is why the Oslo Freedom Forum is important. It recognizes the universality of freedom. It is a forum where it's also an example where people in the photographs you see have success stories and potential success stories. When the day comes for Tibet, it will be a success story of nonviolence and democracy. That is why Tibet is a litmus test for the international community and China. If you don't succeed, international community fails with us. If you don't succeed, unfortunately, it will be another sad story for many of the activists and dissidents here. It will be a, it will be a failure of democracy and nonviolence, which we should not allow, which we know will not happen. That is why nonviolence and democracy will succeed. Tibet will succeed when that day comes. That will be one of the best stories of the 21st century. And that will soon come. That's why I left Harvard to go to Dharamsala so that I could be closer to Tibet. When that day comes, you all are welcome to come to Lhasa. Before that, you all are welcome to come to Dharamsala, which is a beautiful town. But don't come in winter. <laughs> we don't have central heating. As we say in Dharamsala, in winter, you have to, it's warmer outside the house than inside the house. So you have to make do with the sun that you get during the day and survive the night and come see me in the morning. <laughs> I'm sure uh, we all are in it because we believe in freedom. We all are in it, we have subscribed to 
freedom. We all are in it because we are invested in nonviolence. We can't make, we can't have nonviolence and freedom fail. And that is why Tibet will succeed. That we believe. And don't forget, no attachment, please. Thank you. Thank you.